Je suis donc ravi de vous retrouver. I'm delighted to see you again as we continue with our Franco-German Energy Forum, I'm working with Patricio Fon for this round table. Um, the Green Deal, the European Green Deal. I'm sorry, it's true that uh, we have gotten a bit behind schedule, but uh, nonetheless, we're quite delighted to be in this prestigious building, the Hotel de Hocaire. And the, you will be able to have the access to the audio files for this conference for members on our site. And you'll have a resume available for everyone, including non-members. And you are welcome to ask questions in Slido, in the Slido platform. We have Barbara Pompili, French Minister of the Ecological Transition. We're delighted to be here in your ministry and here in Paris, and to be here physically, it's really nice to see people again. And we're also delighted to have Andreas Fest, State Secretary at the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Of course, we will be talking with you in a moment about what's at stake for you and to understand uh, more about uh, what you talked about in your introduction, that is your objectives. And also we have a European vision with Kadri Simpson. Hello, Kadri. You are the European Commissioner for Energy at the EU Commission. We'll start with uh, Barbara Pompili talking about what's at stake in the Green Deal with regard to Europe and France, the objective of obtaining carbon neutrality by 2050. So I'd like to ask you a first question because we're here at this round table. We've been talking about means to achieve our climate goals. Let's have a look at what is at stake and how the EU is accompanying goal, uh, countries in the achievement of these goals. I think we perhaps have a connection problem. Can you hear us? Can you speak, please? We have a problem here. We cannot hear you. I guess it was too much to wish for. I think we'll have to do a little test and come back to you in a moment. Of course, this is always a problem when you do things live. Uh, it's true that when everyone is present in the room, it's always a lot easier. So we'll try to connect with Kedley Simpson again. Meanwhile, we have uh, Barbara Pompili here with us. And let's talk about the French strategy with regard to the Green Deal. Yes. Uh, Madam Commissioner, delighted to have you here with us. I hope that we will be able to hear from you as well, in addition to seeing you on the screen. Indeed, because of the urgent situation with the climate, we are entering into a decisive decade. And in this time, every action becomes very important. And when we look at the Green Deal, the EU has clearly shown that it is at the front lines of fighting against climate change, fighting for the founding values of Europe, democracy, freedom, justice. All of these values bring Europeans together and environmental protection is part of those values. We have a very heavy responsibility, which is to translate this political ambition without precedent into the national scope as well. So I'd like to talk with you about the means that we will be implementing here in France in order to achieve our climate goals. Today, the first framework for action has been set by the EU. I think Kadri Simpson will probably talk about this. The Green Deal pushed our reduction to of greenhouse gases to at least minus 55 percent by 2030 with regard to 2019. And in July, the Fit for 55 package was produced, which has a, a whole set of mechanisms and tools that will serve as a roadmap to help us move through the following, the upcoming decades. And 
I'd like to say that the Commission and Kadri Simpson, the European Commissioner for Energy, have done a fabulous job, and I'm really delighted to be able to discuss it with her today. In this context, we have some serious negotiation awaiting us. As of next January 1, France will be the president of the EU Council, and you know one of our first priorities will clearly be to push for the 50-55 package and to focus on a progress that is already underway under the Slovenian presidency. The idea is to adopt as quickly as possible these texts to the national legislation. It's difficult to give a specific time frame because negotiation takes time and we can see that some of these uh, topics are quite sensitive and it's important that all of the countries line up behind these goals, and we have to see how we can apply all of these reforms that are quite ambitious on the paper, but that require a lot of measures, including social measures, to accompany them. In France, it is important that the energy transition takes place in an inclusive manner and that no one is left behind. We will be especially attentive to this during the upcoming negotiations with the idea that no household, no business, no region should be left behind. This is why we are very attentive to the social consequences of the current crisis of energy prices. And if we're not careful, the transit in itself may be called into question. And this is a European debate that has taken place around the Fit for 55 program. And we will be looking at the electricity market, the retail electricity market, and looking at what changes might be required there without affecting the wholesale market. And I'm looking at my German colleague because, indeed, we have to be sure that we also ensure security of supply. So there is a margin of maneuver that we have to keep in mind because we don't want to disrupt the wholesale energy supply market. With regard to the energy policy that we are deploying on the national level in order to reach our European goals, we have a threefold approach, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and nuclear energy. The first axis is a moderation of our needs or reducing our needs. Why? Because, well, in order to give you an idea, we have a national strategy, a low-carbon national strategy, that calls for 40% decrease in our consumption of energy by 2050. In France and elsewhere, two-thirds of our production, of two-thirds of our consumption, excuse me, is a consumption of fossil fuels. Sometimes we forget this because we confuse energy and electricity. So two-thirds of our energy supply is fossil fuel. So if we want to bring that down, we must first of all become more efficient and reduce demand. And that's energy efficiency. We can do this through the massification of renovation of our housing stock, financing to help individuals. This is the Ma Prime Renov mission. We had a 700,000 request this year for aid in renovating buildings and also another branches to improve energy efficiency in industries. So France is working to modernize the automobile stock as well. We have accorded a bonus payments since 2017 to people who replace old-fashioned cards with more energy efficient, efficient cards. And so cars, we think that it is important to move towards uh, fully electric cars and transport in general. So the second direction, and I would say, in fact, the cornerstone of our energy policy has to do with the ambitious development of renewable energy, which will enable us to produce decarbonized electricity that we are in need of. France is deeply engaged in 
uh, reducing its dependence on fossil fuels and reducing the use of this type of energy, this will be an important aspect of our program. In order to develop renewable energies, we have a policy that we have implemented that will enable us to uh, improve our strategic autonomy to fight against climate change and to sustainably protect our citizens from volatile electricity prices. And I think our German colleague will agree with me that this is a big challenge that we have to meet. Our pluriannual energy program, the PPE, which was adopted last April 2020, this is an ambitious program. We seek to double the capacity of renewable energy production so that 40% of our electricity produced will be from renewables. France is moving forward on this path, even though we are a bit behind some other countries. I have already talked to Kedley Simpson about this just a few months ago. Today, 25% of our electricity is produced by renewable energy against 21% in 2018. But of course, we must try even harder in order to reach our goals. For example, for photovoltaic, we have to multiply our capacity by seven or 12 fold for offshore wind power. We have to move from 1,000 to 4,000 offshore uh, facilities. We're also looking at six billion euros a year already for power purchasing agreements. The climate and resilience law that was voted on this year, this summer, has created a certificate for the biogas industry, for biomethane in particular, which is an energy that will have its role in our energy mix. This also uh, focuses on installing uh, solar panels on buildings such as office buildings and shopping centers. And finally, what's very important also is acceptability of renewable energy. We have consolidated the role of local authorities with regard to setting up wind power stations. It's important that uh, citizens accept these new technologies. Over the past few weeks, I've presented several action plans for controlled development of wind power and acceleration of solar power, and also encouraging citizen-driven renewable energy projects. We will continue to rely on nuclear power. That's the third part of our en energy transition policy. Energy nucle nuclear energy is a, a majority of supplies and majority of our power. We will be using more renewable energy. President Emmanuel Macron said that we would be building new nuclear reactors, the objective being from 2035 to continue to supply uh, electric power for new uses and also to replace uh, plants that are coming to the end of their life cycle. So we will be looking at renewables and nuclear in a mix that have regu fairly, to have a fairly stable price range. And this will enable us to commit fully to the energy transition because one of the obstacles to the energy transition today is indeed that people are afraid and people may also feel discouraged because they think it's too ambitious. So we're trying to find solutions to respond to these fears. So this is what I wanted to say with regard to the basic engagements of the French government in matters of energy policy. France is very attentive to working with others as we establish our policies. This is true for our climate policies. It is a roadmap that we share we revise it every five years with the help of others. And November 2nd, we announced the adaptation of our strategy to the new European Green Deal. And in 2023 and 2024, we will be reviewing it again. So at this roundtable, I'd like to focus also on the economic aspect of 
our transition. I know that's important to you too, whether it's Kadri Simpson or our German neighbors. The success of the energy transition will necessarily call on having energy sovereignty and a strong industrial sector. And this is very important in France and in Europe. And this is clearly seen in the nature of programs such as the EPCE in the matters of, uh, in the area of batteries and hydrogen development. A year ago, we devoted 7 billion euros to developing decarbonated hydrogen power solutions. And last 12th October, the President of the Republic announced the France 2030 plan with 8 billion euros planned for the energy sector to build a better decarbonated, more resilient nation. And a nation benefiting from green energy. We also plan to decarbonize industry and 4 billion euros investment will be invested in the transport, in particular electric and hybrid cars and automobiles. So that's just briefly what I wanted to say. France is uh, putting the means behind the programs that we have defined to promote renewable energy and the energy transition. We have we are making uh, our best efforts with using as much synergy as possible with uh, Germany and other partners. And I think we need to work together while each country retains its specific nature. I think that sometimes we have very different approaches in our energy mix, but we need to show that we can nonetheless meet European expectations so I'm uh, delighted to hear from you and to work with you this morning. Thank you very much for this introduction with regard to France's uh, energy ambitions. So I think now we have Cadley Simpson with us again. So, Madam Commissioner, can you hear us and can you speak to us? Good morning. I have been with you all the time. I heard you very well. And I truly regret that I can't be with you um, in Paris but I actually plan to be in France um, next week when I present in front of a plenar in Strasbourg um, the State of Energy Union report. And after two weeks, we will have a meeting with Barbara in Paris. So, uh, and I do uh, expect that there will be lots of high-level meetings in France during French presidency. Um, the Franco-German cooperation uh, is an important um, platform for establishing the, the political direction in a number of doma domains for us. And, and this is particularly valuable for the energy transition. And uh, I would like to thank the Franco-German community for being an ambitious and strong ally of the European Green Deal. Um, we all know that we have a tremendous uh, opportunity ahead of us. The transition uh, will make our economy cleaner from one side and, of course, more competitive. And reducing the greenhouse gas emissions will also be essential to maintain our way of life and to adapt to climate change and to lead climate mitigation. So everyone can agree that there are many ways to reach the decarbonization. And, uh, and, um, and if, if uh, we do have these useful forums where we can discuss which path uh, leads to decarbonization, or even um, um, what kind of available te technologies can contribute, then it's very useful. Um, because member states uh, will design the policies and determine their energy mix on the road towards 2050. Um, and irrespective of uh, member states' detailed choices, all of this, it must be done in a just and fair manner uh, so this is also the reason why the Commission is taking um, the current rise in energy prices uh, very seriously, um, and especially the impact on, uh, on energy poverty and well, more vulnerable households and small businesses. So um, we, we presented a communication on energy prices um, this October, 
Um, and uh, this communication outlines our short, medium and long term measures for Europe's um, people and businesses. Because we have to make sure that energy price increase uh, is, that is mainly driven by global demand dynamics and the shortage of supply. It should not become a barrier to climate neutrality and it should rather give us courage to invest into energy efficiency and smart use of renewables and uh, this will be the right choice to reduce energy bills um, and um, and I, I am absolutely convinced that earlier we act uh, the more we will save and uh, now it is a good time to take advantage of the EU and uh, the domestic recovery funds for example to prioritize renovation as Barbara already explained to us what is happening in France and, and there are other energy efficiency measures also available. Um, and getting people out of energy poverty, um, this can be the most effective path to cultivate support for the energy transition. Um, we know that already, uh, right now, renewables are uh, the cheapest source of power in many parts of the European Union. Last year, for the first time ever, renewables overtook fossil fuels as the Europe's main power source. And, and um, the European Green Deal helps reduce energy dependency and uh, it helps us to increase our resilience in a fair way. And European climate law um, that was anonymous, uh, unanimously agreed um, also um, tasks us to, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, already this decade by 55%. And, uh, and um, to put it into legislation, the European Commission uh, proposed Fit for 55 package. It includes also review of two important energy proposals, the Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive. Um, both of them um, um, will update targets and, uh, and soon we will follow up uh, these proposals, this specific legislation on decarbonizing gas and also buildings. And all these uh, proposals will be uh, negotiated uh, during the uh, French presidency. And, and of course, uh, we need also uh, um, measures how to, well, uh, how to um, help the most vulnerable. So in this regard, the Social Climate Fund that would use uh, ETS revenues to support clean energy and mobility projects with, uh, with the most vulnerable households is an important uh, proposal also from the summer package. And, um, and we know that uh, green transition provides also vast investment opportunities. Um, European Union has committed to mobilize at least 1 trillion in sustainable investment inside Europe by 2030. And addition, in addition, the new European budget has earmarked 30% of the EU funds for green investment. And this is the biggest climate investment pro program right now worldwide. Um, I know that French and German national recovery and resilience plans allocate respectively 46% and 42.4% of spending to climate-related activities. And, and in this regard, our Fit for 55 package is another testament to the ambition to make Europe the first climate-neutral continent. So my message is that chance transition is not just an option. Um, or a moral obligation, it is essential to make decarbonization a reality and we will need to join forces with all of our citizens and um, they need to see uh, the benefits of the transition in concrete terms. They need to see lower bills, a new job opportunities and, and improved uh, quality of life. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I thank uh, both uh, Minister Barbara Van Pili and State Secretary Anders fight for very strong support for our decarbonisation uh, um, policies so far. Thank you. Merci beaucoup à vous, Kadri. Thank you very much, Kadri Simpson, for this presentation of what's at stake in Europe and how Europe is accompanying countries. Uh, of course, uh, Barbara Pompili, you can react to this. Andreas Feisch, perhaps you could say a little bit more about what Kadri Simpson has said and perhaps also talk about the climate objectives for Germany. 
Ja, vielen Dank. Liebe Kadri, schön, dass wir uns zumindest virtuell sehen. Liebe Barbara Pompelli, herzlichen Dank dafür, dass wir hier sein dürfen und uns hier austauschen an einer wichtigen Wegmarke. Es ist gesagt worden, diese Transformation ist fundamental. Sie betrifft alle Bereiche der Wirtschaft, alle Bereiche der Gesellschaft. Und insofern ist dieser umfangliche Ansatz, den Fit for 55 bietet, ähm, in Umsetzung des Green Deals, den der insbesondere unter der Führung äh, von Kadri Simpson und ihrem Team erarbeitet worden ist, äh, von sehr großer Bedeutung. Es ist, glaube ich, gar nicht zu überschätzen, äh, welchen Impact das haben wird auf die Europäische Union und äh, die Debatten, die kommen und äh, insofern ist es sehr gut, dass Frankreich die Präsidentschaft übernehmen wird. Diese Debatten werden nicht einfach sein, äh, zu führen und Kompromisse zu erarbeiten, die nötig sind. Weil natürlich, und äh, Kadri, du hast äh, sehr stark auf die, das, die Just Transition abge, äh, abgehoben. Äh, natürlich haben wir nicht überall das, das, das gleiche Wohlfahrtsniveau in Europa. Das heißt, von Bulgarien bis Schweden dann eine Klimapolitik zu machen, äh, die glaubwürdig ist, die auch die Ziele erreicht, äh, erreichen hilft, aber die natürlich auch äh, auf die Bedürfnisse der Menschen Excuse und der me. Unternehmen... Oh ja, Mikrofon für die Translation. <lacht> ähm, Entschuldigung. Ähm, die, die, äh, die alle mitzunehmen, ähm, das ist, glaube ich, die ganz große Herausforderung. Und das nicht nur innerhalb Europas, sondern auch in einem Wettbewerb Europas mit dem Rest der Welt, das heißt also, dass unsere Industrien, und Deutschland ist ein exportorientiertes Land, dass also unsere Industrien weiterhin wettbewerbsfähig sind in einem Wettbewerb mit China, mit dem asiatischen Raum und mit Nordamerika. Wir brauchen also einen pragmatischen, aber auch einen umfänglichen, einen ordnungspolitisch sinnvollen Weg, diese Treibhausgasneutralität zu erreichen. Und ich glaube, heute ist deutlich geworden, auch durch den Vortrag der Ökonomen, dass enorme Investitionen notwendig sind, um dieses zu erreichen. Und ähm, als Betriebswirt sage ich immer, Investitionen sind keine Kosten, sondern Investitionen schafft Vermögen. Äh, wenn aber, und das ist passiert jetzt aktuell, oberhalb der Abschreibungen investiert wird, also wir investieren zusätzlich, obwohl wir ein Energiesystem haben, was ja heute Strom und Energie zur Verfügung stellt, dann führt das zu höheren Schulden oder es muss eben finanziert werden. Und das ist dieser Übergang. Das ist das Problem, das ist der Problem des Übergangs in einen eingeschwungenen Zustand. Und dafür brauchen wir Finanzierung äh, und Finanzierungsrahmenbedingungen. Es ist aber nicht möglich, dass der Staat und die staatlichen Budgets diese Investitionen ausschließlich staatlich finanzieren. Es muss privates Kapital geben. Und deswegen brauchen wir ein System, in dem am Ende des Tages Konsumenten bereit sind, für diese grünen Produkte, die dann resultieren aus der Wertschöpfungskette, bezahlen wollen. Das heißt, wir brauchen einen Markt für grünen Stahl, einen Markt für grünes Plastik. Wir brauchen einen Markt dafür, dass ähm, in Gebäude investiert werden soll. Und ich glaube, das ist eine entscheidende Wegmarke. Das haben wir bislang nämlich so noch nicht geschafft. Wir haben... Ähm, unheimlich viele Anreize dafür gegeben, gerade in Deutschland, aber auch in Frankreich, in anderen Ländern, dafür, dass grüne Energie in den Markt kommt. Aber wir haben noch keine ausreichenden Anreize dafür, dass Konsumenten grüne Produkte kaufen wollen, über Quoten oder was auch immer. Teilweise haben wir das in dem Bereich der Kraftstoffquoten, äh, aber noch nicht in all den anderen Enough incentives to encourage customers to turn towards these green products. With regard to Germany, we have adopted a climate law about a year ago, and we worked on this after a decision by the Constitutional Court. We want to be carbon neutral by 2042, and we hope to increase the share of renewables by 2030. We're talking about electric consumption, which is at 52 percent, so we have to accelerate the development of renewable energies, the price of which has fallen sharply. But beyond all that, 
system costs are increasing, so we have to invest in the electric network as well. We have a very clear roadmap for that, but we are currently behind schedule, and so we must increase our efforts. There's a very controversial debate on the subject that has to do with the acceptability of these measures in the different regions. We also need a coherent strategy so that green molecules, as I mentioned earlier, are included in our strategy, that is our strategy for hydrogen. And for carrying out this transition, we have to focus on green energy. So we spoke a lot about cost this morning, and we spoke about with the professors this morning, we spoke about 438 billion euro per year. So we remember also what was touched upon this morning, the European Court of Accounts that spoke of even quite larger figures than that, uh, that will have to be invested. And then we also had Mattis, uh, Professor Mattis saying that it's going to be quite challenging to do with that, and it's the notion of transition, then transition in itself is going to be quite challenging. But ultimately, it raised the question, are we going to be able to pull through? Because here the challenge ahead of us is quite massive, and here we're talking about also a, having a fair transition. We speak a lot of people in, who are quite vulnerable uh, in, in France and Germany. So how do we tackle all of that? I really think that we need to have everyone working together and fighting together. And really the only way we can have a successful transition is if everyone is on board. Now it's easier said than done, but getting everyone battle ready, it means that the general discourse needs to be very clear. We need to clearly send the message that there is no plan B. To have a competitive economy in our in our respective countries in the coming few decades, we need to act now. We need to put in the necessary means. Now, through that, we have financial incentives for respective countries. So we've spoken about a lot of measures so far. It could be financial aid, public public assistance. It could also be helping companies or companies can also pitch in. For example, we have the energy certification processes through which companies feel that they will, in some sense, they're actually obliged, they're forced to put in certain measures to help us implement public policy. But on top of that, there's the whole range of banking and financial institutions with incentives that we can work through that way. And this is a really important point. I want to hammer home because there are still new people digging their heels in. There is still still too much inertia and it's not widespread enough. We need to see more action. So think about just renewable energies. There are still many areas in France and Germany and elsewhere where it's getting access to renewable energies, to wind farms, onshore, offshore wind energy, or even here, methane energy. And the reason that people have little access to that is because often there's a big picture idea, climate change, global warming, greenhouse gases, everyone understands that. And then they see wind farms, but no one really explains what's happening here. We don't really saying that we are trying to take our countries to move from one model into another, and that the model that we're leaving behind, we have to do so without any regrets, because it is on the decline. To give you a concrete example of what I'm trying to talk about here, I was speaking with the French president uh, due, when we were out visiting a, a factory in the south of France that uh, belongs to Schumberger. And the factory was losing all of its market shares. Its order book was emptying. They went from 1,200 employees down to 400 employees. And there was no future for the, for the factory. At least that's what they thought. And then they started to move production over to electrolysis machines to produce hydrogen. And they wanted to center their investment strategy around renewables as opposed to fossil fuels, which is what their strategy used to be. And overnight, their order book started filling up. They were able to bring life back into the factory. And everyone said, 
It's amazing because here we're working towards the future. We're working towards something which is going to help give us a job, but also give jobs to our children. So, you know, in the field, my job's done for me when you have an example like that. People are excited about these sorts of projects and there's a sense of hope. The environmental transition, the ecological transition is far too often seen as being a constraint, as a barrier that people have to overcome and a source of concern. So it's so it's up to us to change the narrative. We have to provide uh, key examples and through those examples we can find ways of building this uh, future together. And once we change the narrative, everything becomes easier. It becomes easier for us but also for other European Union members who are still facing the challenge that they have so much to overcome to reach uh, to reach a net zero target, to move away from fossil fuels. And these are countries who need assistance and we provide assistance for a fair transition. For example, we have the ETS extension, which is also going to be part of coming up with some form of social fund. But on top of this deep-seated demand that there is from these countries, we also have to still work together. We have to work together so that this transition can be done efficiently, effectively, without leaving anyone behind. And I really insist on this notion of narrative because it is the fundamental aspect of engaging people with the transition. We have a question here saying that uh, our energy is essential to development, but what about uh, renewable energy installations? Will it not have an impact on the trade, uh, on the, on the, on the, on the import-export ratio between France and Germany? What about, uh, maybe talk about that and also a bit about cost. Well, when we're talking about France and Germany and trade between our two nations, we mustn't forget that we are part of a European system. There are nine countries around us, nine neighbors, and we call them our electricity neighbors. And we could also think of Norway. So obviously, needs of electricity are going to increase in the coming years. And currently, we import export energy between France to France. We are net exporters between, uh, towards France. Same for Denmark when it comes to wind power. And I think this energy exchange is going to increase. Quite simply because energy production is, is still somewhat an inefficient process. And in Germany, we have great energy needs because we have a str uh, highly dense population and our grid is, our population is divided in a way so there's a lot of people in the west and the south. So you have energy production which is not evenly spread and unfortunately in the south of the west there is little chance or little room for us to develop renewable energy. So what means is that we have to import energy into that region. So we're working with the partners and, for example, with the Danes, we have a memorandum of understanding on constructing, uh, building an artificial island in the North Sea. For 10 gigawatt hours of offshore wind will be built there. Three gigawatts also in the Baltic Sea are, going, are set to be built. So this is much more energy than what the local market in Denmark can absorb. So because of that, they said, Let's work together and let's, uh, let's trade energy. So and I think examples like that are just going to show how much more energy we'll be selling and exporting and importing in the future. Now we just need to find the cheapest and most affordable way of producing that energy. A quick comment just before we move on. I see time ticking away. There's a lot today. And, but this is for you, Barbara Pompili, because this question is also for you. I'll just to add to what Andrea said, and I agree with him. The energy market, the electricity market, currently in Europe is one which works well, but will need to be strengthened in the future. Because as we diversify the 
forms of production, we will need to take that into account within the grid. Now, if we are less dependent on fossil fuels, and we are, I mean, the aim is to completely phase it out, it will help us become more independent, more sovereign when it comes to the way we deal with energy and electricity within Europe. And obviously, it's a becoming a major geopolitical sticking point. So our strategy in France is to produce as much energy as we can within our country. And obviously, with some forms of with with hydro and wind and solar, by combining them together to also deal with storage issues. So by having a good mix of energy across Europe, Europe can work together, and I think it has to work together. So our grids, they need to be rethought, they need to be, they need to change. And I mean, retrofitting our grids also comes at a cost, but it's a fundamental, it's essential investment that has to be done if we really want to uh, properly succeed. And this is something, again, that we need to do with our European counterparts. So in terms of the trade balance with nuclear power, we can very easily export energy. But despite that, we, there are still times where at peak energy consumption, we still have to import energy. Now, I don't really have a true assessment of that because it's still underway. But I think that whatever investment we do, it will pay off because just in terms of energy sovereignty within Europe, it will pay off in its own right. But I think it's so important that we work together in terms of trade and in terms of energy. Are there any comments like you would to make about costs and investment? Well, if I can step in, uh, well, I think that, um, that uh, we have to learn from every crisis. And right now, we are in the middle of the crisis of high energy prices. And this actually shows us that we have to step up our efforts because only by increasing our um, diver, di, di, um, diversification of supply and the production of local renewables, we can become more resilient. Um, right now, two thirds of our consumption is covered by uh, fossil fuels, and we are heavily dependent on imported uh, natural gas and uh, oil products. So, uh, so um, we have, well, uh, um, in this regard, invest into our own production, and that helps us in longer run to uh, to save uh, save for um, very volatile um, fossil fuel prices. So, um, European Union experience uh, with renewables has shown that we can produce clean energy at very low price. Um, the biggest uh, the share of our uh, of renewables in our energy mix, the less less vulnerable we will be to fossil fuels price fluctuation. Uh, and again, in particular, uh, we will be less vulnerable uh, uh, in the context of massive increases like the current one. And, and of course, in parallel, an increase in energy efficiency across the board will reduce energy needs for both families and businesses. So despite the fact that decarbonization process needs massive investments, it also allows us to save from uh, uh, from our um, trade, um, where we are dependent dependent on uh, fossil fuel providers, who who sometimes are not so reliable as we would like to see them uh, being. Um, and and of course um, another take uh, from COP26 was that uh, right now our trading partners, they do see that uh, carbon has to have a price. From our side, ETS uh, sends very clear price signals to the market, and more and more uh, uh, international players have announced that they will introduce similar kind of carbon pricing scheme of their own. And I think that our carbon, uh, border, carbon border adjustment mechanism plays a role here. So it sends uh, a signal to our trading partners that we will ask them to do the same that we ask from our own businesses. And, uh, and with that, uh, I thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion. It was, uh, it was uh, a pleasure to, to listen to you, Barbara and uh, Anders. Thank you. 
Merci, ah, merci beaucoup. Alors justement, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I think you really touched on a fantastic topic there. And we have five more minutes just to quickly talk about that. The issue of means given the issues that we're facing, the, the issue of carbon, the carbon market, the uh, adjustment measures and mechanisms that are being put in place. So often when we talk about means, tell us a bit about the means that are necessary to reach our targets. Well, you're right, it's a fundamental issue. So at last, the carbon, amend, uh, carbon amendment measures are being discussed and it's fantastic. It's a way of reassuring investors. It's about reassuring business. And we're asking a lot of investors and business because they are going to have to do so much when it comes to dealing with the, the uh, dealing with all of the reform that we are bringing in. And for them, it's going to be uh, quite, uh, quite binding and quite constricting as well for them because there's so much that they need to do with all of the reforms that we're bring, that we're bringing in. So here, the fact that we have this mechanism that's going to be phased in, and remember, we need to really inform people about this. The idea isn't just that we're going to suddenly bring in a mechanism that will apply everywhere at the same time. This is something that we need to work with. We've been working with it with our respective partners to ensure that it's the best solution possible. So the idea is to phase this mechanism in. We'll start off with a few industries, for example, the steel industry, or, or the cement industry as well. So these are these will serve as examples for the rest of the rest of the economy. And the aim is to really get this message that a carbon price, a carbon price is on the table. And the COP26, it was an opportunity to make headway on that. But the carbon price is essential. It's an unavoidable essential factor if we want to have a successful transition and everyone needs to be on board. And the European Union, we really have to be a driving force behind this. Remember, the mechanism, it's not, uh, we're not just trying to protect trade here. This is important to understand. This mechanism is one which will help us protect the environment and reach our climate targets. So it's a mechanism that that helps fight for the climate and the environment. And this is something we'll have to repeat time and time again in the coming months and years. Andreas, what would you like to say about the carbon market and the mechanism that we were just talking about? I think it's important to, 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 have, this, uh, to have these prices because that way we'll be able to deal with emissions and the mechanism seems to be quite a good mechanism. In Germany, we already have a carbon price for mobility for the construction sector. Now, obviously it's not accepted by all and we need to account for that. But also carbon needs to be dealt with if we want our industry to be competitive uh, abroad. As we are looking at today, this is something which is funded by the federal budget. We have electricity offset measures and the like, and that is in place for renewables. And this is uh, such an important way of working, of having governments work for it. And this is why the Fit for 55 package is uh, is working so well because we have, for example, the CBAM type measures. But I'm probably a little more reticent than you, Madam Minister, simply because my major concern is that uh, people may interpret this as being a protectionist measure by uh, people outside of the EU. Germany, we export energy. And when I think of, say, China and the, the share of coal, and they have a huge share of coal, but also renewables on the rise. And I think it's important that we that we try and say that saying whether steel, steel exports are good or not, we need to take that into account. We need to look at the at the competitors on the market. So I think it's important that we come up that we realize that. Uh, this hasn't been decided yet. It's still up for negotiation, but we need to deal with fair, uh, with trade issues 
and international trade issues. So we obviously, we would rather promote the notion of a climate club, which is what we will focus on as uh, at the G7, and also uh, something that we've spoken at the G20. And I think it would be interesting to see that, uh, to ensure that for each industry we have fair conditions for trade. And as we always say in Germany, it's good to have, it's all goodwill, but it you, it mustn't be a, fail, a failure nonetheless. Kadri, would you like to wrap up this uh, final section? One minute, I know it's a tall order, one minute to wrap up this session. Well, let's, uh, I think that we all agree that uh, uh, this fundamental structural change uh, um, will uh, cover all soci entire society, especially um, this will not be easy for industrial societies. Uh, and also for those who have been dependent on fossil fuels for decades. Uh, so it requires efforts from all, and we need to pay attention that, uh, that um, this uh, transition um, is fair and is supporting our competitiveness. And from uh, European Commission, we are ready to support uh, this hard work wherever possible. Uh, I do have great expectations for French presidency uh, next year, and I do hope that uh, during French presidency uh, we can negotiate with member states all our proposals uh, that help us to achieve higher targets for 2030 and that are extremely necessary um, to become climate neutral by 2050. So, uh, well, French presidency takes over in very, at very crucial times. And, and, uh, and actually sets uh, the pace uh, how, we will, uh, how, how we will use our uh, recovery funds, how we will manage to raise our targets for 2030, and uh, how seriously can our international partners take us and our promises. And, uh, and I have no doubts that uh, under the French presidency, we will deliver everything that we promised. Thank you. Well, just uh, obviously, uh, I need a quick uh, reaction from you because uh, up the next milestone is going to be for France. Yes, uh, we understand the what is at stake here. So the time we're in is such a crucial point in history. We have the ambition, and we need to show you that we need to, to work with each other, but also with partners aboard and. The climate challenge is a challenge that is here, and it, we need an answer for it. We need solutions for it. And I'm quite excited at the opportunity of starting off the uh, French presidency of the EU at the beginning of next year, and it's going to be exciting to work with the work at the Commission because they've done fantastic, but they've come up with a fantastic proposal, and now we need to really implement it. So a huge challenge, but also a great deal of excitement at being able to make that come to fruition, to really push it, push forward that agenda as much as possible. Well, that's a fantastic way of summing up the roundtable discussion. We've got major issues, and thank you, Madam Minister, State Secretary, and also Madam Commissioner. Thank you very much for your time. We will now have a, a break for those who are here in in Paris. So you can have lunch. You just follow the signs to go and have lunch. For those of you who are joining us uh, from abroad, in just 10 minutes' time at uh, at 12.45, there will be a debate between Euro European parliamentarians, MEPs, and a number of students, and there will be a one-hour lunchtime debate. And then we'll be back again after that at 2 p.m. Paris time for the afternoon session of the Franco-German Energy Forum. See you all then.